Thank you very much. Um, let me review a little bit from last time. So the point of view that I want to take is um, goes back to Carol Erisman in 1936, where he outlined a program for studying flat connections or flat geometric structures on manifolds. And the way I want to phrase it is that we fix a topology. And in this talk, um, sigma will be the closed oriented surface, this genus three surface. And hopefully I'll have some time to discuss the building blocks of closed surfaces, which are surfaces with boundary. So for example, a pair of pants, three held sphere, one hold torus. And hopefully if I have time, the four hold sphere. This is an extremely general <clears throat> construction. The first side of the um, relation is the topology sigma. The second side is the um, geometry. And this will be a fine geometry arising from a homogeneous space of a um, Lie group. So, for example, Euclidean geometry, ones I'll talk about today, affine and projective geometry. And <clears throat> projective geometry includes affine geometry, which includes Euclidean geometry. And projective geometry also includes hyperbolic geometry. OK, so the. Could so you be using the plan model for that? Or exactly, exactly. So. When I talk about projective geometry today, I'll just talk about real projective geometry. The Poincaré model arises from looking at complex projective geometry, which is extremely well. The Poincaré. The Poincaré. The comes from the Poincaré. Right. So the so the, the hyperbolic geometry inside the real projective plane you could conic. And the conic separates RP2 into two components. The convex component is the model for the hyperbolic plane. Okay, and so these are the structures I'll talk about today. The um, classification, what I'll call the classification problem. is to form a deformation space, a space whose points represent the equivalence classes of structures. And we want to put a little extra structure that is a marking called the deformation space def gx of sigma. So all the ways of putting the geometry so we have a manifold M that's modeled the way that I described last time on this geometry, coordinate charts mapping into X, the coordinate changes line in G. And that's, these will be a space of marked structures. And a marking means a, a homeomorphism or a homotopy equivalence, a diffeomorphism. In these low dimensions, it doesn't really matter. So I'll be uh, vague about that. But we have topology here and geometry here. And the marking will be a, an equivalence. It's like a topological coordinate system. We're studying that. How the structures vary. And two markings will be equivalent. It's a very loose equivalence relation. If there's a GX isomorphism,
such that this diagram commutes up to homotopy. Okay, so, the, so we're fixing the reference surface sigma. And the markings of the torsor the mapping class group. That is by rearranging the situation, the mark different choices of markings correspond to applying a mapping class homeomorphism of sigma. So the mapping class group is the principal object of study is for me it will be defined as the group of isotopy classes of homeomorphisms. Sigma. In general, this relates to the fundamental group in that it maps into the outer automorphism group of pi. Pi will denote fundamental groups. So last time I gave several examples of the deformation space. For example, if sigma is the sphere and the geometry is Euclidean, this is an empty set. If sigma is a torus, the space of Euclidean structures is a deforma the, um, deformation space, the space of bases. This is the symmetric space, homogeneous space, GLNR over ON. Assuming it's a geodesically complete. That's right. 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 So that I'm assuming if it's compact, then it will be geodesically complete if it's Euclidean. That's not true if it's affine, so I need to make it special hypothesis there. And the mapping class group for the case of a torus is just GLNs. Okay, so there. And so in all of these examples, the mapping class group is acting properly on the deformation space. And you can form a nice quotient. But in general, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment, we can't assume that. And we have an interesting dynamical systems arising from this classification problem. Okay, so you are telling already for the torus. I'm sorry. Already for the torus, you have some strange action tension. Not right. Yeah, right in the affine case, huh? and I'll describe. I didn't get a chance last time to describe that. Okay, so. Um, the way this relates to character varieties is, is the following. So we have the um, space of Marx structures, sigma, I'll use them for the geometric manifold. And there's a well-defined map, which I'll call polynomial map, that now maps into the homomorphisms in the fundamental group pi the fundamental group of sigma into G, but fundamental group involves a base point in its definition and we don't, <clears throat> and there are various choices. This is only defined up to the action of inner automorphisms of G. As I mentioned before, pi G has an action of Composition with automorphisms of pi on one side and automorphisms of G on the other. Subgroup of inner automorphisms to form this quotient. What remains, and this is important, is that this now space inherits an out pi. And the choice of change of markings is given by an action of the map of the fast group on this side. And this map is equivariant. Okay, so everything comes down to the H principle, right? And so the H principle <laughs> applies here, and this is a, a result of Thurston, more or less unpublished. It's in his um, mimeographed notes, Princeton University, 
where he first states this theorem in this generality, and that I'll put it, I'll write it this way. It tries to be a local homeomorphism. And the problem is that this space is in general pretty bad. Everything that could go wrong can go wrong. And palm pi g is a nice space if, if it's, well, it's a real algebraic set, if, if g is an al a real algebraic Lie group, and the action is a nice algebraic action, but it may not be proper, it may not be free, and in general, this space will be singular. Okay, and one basically forms the um, topology on this space to make this theorem true, to enforce this. Um, but rather than having to deal with home, local homeomorphisms between badly behaved spaces, I'll just be vague and say it this way. And I'll, this is sometimes called the Erisman Thurston theorem, and I think maybe Andre Day. Here. Only the first in theorem that this map is locally onto and locally one to one. Okay, and in particular, any kind of nice algebraic structure, like a symplectic structure on this space, will pull back and define structures on this. So that's have a we reduce to like the fundamental group. And the and the proof of this is basically is now around here it's being called the H principle. Um using transversality and working in the, in the C infinity category, which is perfectly allowable because we're working with um, Lie groups and homogeneous spaces that have natural smooth structures. It's better than real analytic, which is less flexible. Okay. So, so I mentioned Andre Vey. Good news here. And that's, let me just state it in the case I need it, but it's much more general. And that's when GX is hyperbolic geometry. X is a hyperbolic line. Then the deformation space I'll call F of sigma this is the Fricka space of marked. Equivalence spaces, equiv equivalence classes of marked hyperbolic structures on sigma. Okay. And so that maps by holonomy into the homomorphisms in the high one sigma into the group of isometries, which is PSL2R. And this is defined up to the conjugacy. And Good news along the way is that we're mapping into the nice smooth part of the space. So there are no singularities in the homomorphism space. And furthermore, the action by conjugation is proper and free in the quotient map, say, in principle PSL2R bundle. Quite nice. And uh, they proved that this map is open. In fact, it's, it's a. Excuse me? It's in so this is the map on hyperbolic structures. It's got the sigma to surface. Is it compact? So yes. Yeah. Let me take right. Exactly. So the, the sigma is a uh, closed surface in this case. Closed map. Right. So this um, the, the theorem that I just covered up by Erisman, Bay, Thurston uh, assumes compactness for sigma. Since the key step is transversality. So, okay, and so, so this is, um, it's an embedding 
onto a connected component. Topology on the, the space of homomorphisms as the structure is an algebraic set, but I want to take the classical topology, abstract topology, rather, rather than than it's a risky topology. Okay, so the so the Fricka space is a, a nice subset inside the character variety. Now, this is often called the type Miller space. Sigma is a general manifold. It's a, a closed manifold or a closed surface. It's a closed map. Right. In this case, a the phase theorem applies to a closed manifold. To any closed manifold. Right. I'm just dealing with the two dimensional case here. Okay. So there's even more good news. The mapping class group is acting properly and properly discontinuously since it has the discrete topology on the Fricka space. Now the Fricka space can be shown using say French and Nielsen coordinates to be diffeomorphic to the cell of dimension six G minus six. You were about to say that this is type Muller space and then as if that it weren't. It, do you want to say? Right. Well, it, it's equivalent to type Muller space. Oh, okay. okay. But the equivalence is, is highly transcendental yeah. And it's the uniformization theorem. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to say that everything is type Miller space because that gets very confusing. As the next example will we'll show. So, so the so if sigma is a closed oriented surface of genus G. This is a cell of dimension six G minus six. Let me just try to nail you down on a manifold which is not a surface. Right. When, when what do you call then the mapping class group? Um, auto automorphism. Homo -mor the homotopy group. The homotopy group of right. I think there's a name for it. But but, but then it's generally it's not equal to the auto automorphism group. Right. Right. It's, it's that's it's very special. For some that's people. very special. So you, when you say mapping class group, you mean to this homotopy because yes. the auto automorphism group is also acting. It's acting on the on the right hand side, right? Yes. Not on the left hand side. Right. This is extremely interesting. And I don't know if I'll have time to get to it, but the, in the dynamical systems that arise, then the, the relate the, the conflict between the outer automorphism group and the mapping class group leads to interesting dynamical consequences. So the Fricka space identifies with the type number space. By the uniformization theorem. So that in many ways the Teichmuller studied um, Euclidean geometry on the surfaces, and his some um, the geometry that he developed, which included a metric and almost a complex structure. Um, leads to a very nice geometry. The geometry here is much closer to the Vay Peterson geometry, as I'll, as I'll say, say later. And that's more, related, more closely related to the hyperbolic geometry on the surface, whereas Teich Miller theory is really related to the Euclidean geometry on the surface. So. Let's see which direction it's that. Right. So let's see. So every well, the point is that every hyperbolic structure has an underlying complex structure. Since the isometries of the hyperbolic plane are acting holomorphically. Okay. So that's immediate. You know, going in this direction is immediate. The other direction is a deep theorem. And that's that every Riemann surface of genus greater than one has a compatible hyperbolic structure. And so I don't want to, I, I want to pay respect to that, that theorem as we will see later in this talk. Okay, are there any other questions? So, so here you want the genus to be at least two? Yes. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the higher type space. Okay, 
So, so now I want to deal with the case where GX is projective geometry. And so I'll just call that RP2 geometry. And rather than write def GX sigma, I'll just say RP2 of sigma. So this is the deformation space of marked real projective structures on sigma. And um, let me first um, repay the debt from last lecture of um, describing some of the complete affine structures. So let me just look at the subset comprising complete affine structures. Those correspond to representations of the surface as a quotient of um, the affine plane, so R2, by some discrete group of, aff of affine automorphisms. Okay, and then complete, that means it's geodesically complete as a connection. So an affine structure is a, has the Euclidean notion of parallelism on it, and that means that we can talk about curves of zero acceleration, geodesics, and we want the geodesics to be complete. Well, all the Euclidean structures, as I mentioned last time, are affinely equivalent. They're all quotients of lattices, and lattices are related by change of basis matrix. But there are non-Euclidean structures or non-Riemannian structures that are, and I, as far as I know, this goes back to Kuiper in the early 1950s. But, and I'll be very brief here. We start with a diffeomorphism of the plane, which is not affine, but still very simple. It's quadratic. We take x plus y squared, y. So what that does is it takes a lattice of translations and then it bends it into um, In this case, we have horizontal lines. Non horizontal lines get bent into a parabolas, you know, families of parallel parabolas. And if um, lambda is a lattice in the plane, then this is, a, this is a really nice calculation, I think. If you conjugate lambda by f, that remains f. The quadratic terms disappear when you cancel. What you're left with is the cross term square of sum. So this is now the group of affine transformations. Even though f is not itself affine. Wait, yeah, lambda is the lattice. Yeah, the Euclidean translations. So so the point is that if you conjugate a lattice by this mapping, then that you'll you'll get a, the square of a sum when you and then the what you're left and then you conjugate back, you get rid of the quadratic term. What you're left is the, is the cross term, and that's the linear part of the affine transformation. And any lattice, right? Any lattice. So it's clear that this acts properly because it's topologically conjugate to Euclidean structure. Um, Oliver Bowes, this deformation space identifies with the Euclidean plane. Yeah. Sir, well, um, can you go back to the beginning of the board? Right. So what is this statement? What is RP2? So this is, this is a subset of the deformation space. So G would be, um, let's see. The group of projective automorphisms RP2, which is X. This is RP2. The group of automorphisms of RP2 is just, it identifies with it's PGL3R, which is also isomorphic to SL3R as a lead group. So. Okay. Um, and then you're taking this. And then I'm just looking at the subset. That are represented in this way. 
So all these affine transformations are actually extended projective transformations. Okay. So rather than introducing a lot of more notation, I chose to write it this way. And this may not work. Is it for any quadratic or just this specific one? Um, just, the ones that are equivalent to this. And so it's not, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a grubby calculation I would mention to, to prove, to prove this, you're looking at quotients by unipotent subgroups and it's not quite as nice as quotient problems for semi-simple or reductive groups, but. Is, is this R squared the choice of basis for the models? Is this the what, what is the R squared? Um, not not here, like a, in, here? in Bowes's theorem. What is oh, um, no, this is the parameter space. I see. Um, actually, Oliver and I wrote, wrote a little paper where we tried to interpret this map as a period mapping for, for one forms. And so you can, but the, per, the, the, the quotients that you form are sort of messy, sort of tedious calcul linear algebra calculation, but. When you say R squared, you don't imply that there are not a whole body rates. Um, yeah, this is just the homeomorphism type. So the point is that you have lots of these lattices, but then there's a, a large centralizer inside the, inside the affine group. And then you have to form the quotient by that. But when you when you do that, then you get a parameter space, which is homeomorphic to R2. And the Euclidean structures correspond to the zero the origin. So those are all fixed. That point in the deformation space is fixed. And the mapping class group here is sigma a torus. And so the ma mapping class group is just the modular group, GL2. And the action on this space is the usual linear action. Which, if you're a function theorist, it's bad news because you don't want to form functions on the quotient because the quotient is a horrible non Hausdorff intractable space. If you're a dynamicist, this is good news because it's a very interesting dynamical system. Lots of, it preserves area. So that's a symplectic structure on the deformation space. Um, so eventually you add some nice coordinates for this to be. Right, that's, that's what we worked at using, using certain one forms and looking at periods of the fundamental. Um, and so that it's the usual linear action, which is equivalent, basically, it's basically a horror cycle flow on the modular surface, you know, elliptic modular curve. Okay, which is very rich dynamical system. Okay, so that's shows that for studying the um, classification problem, you really want to look at a dynamical system rather than look at a quotient space, the modular space, or the bi-quotient of GLN R that we talked about last time. Okay, so are there any questions here? Now we want to go to higher genus. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, what, what was the what was the M? What is that M? M M is the geometric manifold. So it's a torus with the, the affine structure. It's so M quoted by lambda or by gamma? Um by gamma. Gamma is a subgroup of the affine. Right. Group. And so gamma, let's see, what did I this is gamma. Oh, gamma is topologically conjugate to a lambda. Okay, so I formed the quotient by that. It looks the same topologically, but geometrically it looks quite different. Um, can I can I ask um, uh, this map by Kuiper? Uh, are you um, in some sense? Uh, are you studying the dynamics of that? map in some sense when you make this translation or is dynamics of that map relevant at all to what you do 
The dynamics is not very relevant. The, dynamic of, the dynamics of F is not very relevant. It's just a homeomorphism, I think. That's, what's interesting is more how it conjugates it inside the, the affine group. Okay, so, so the, can I ask, can I ask, can yeah. ask the last question? This was the genus one situation. This is the genus one. Okay. The, gen, the higher genus situation is nicer. I see. If you're, if you're a function theorist, no, it's not as interesting if you're a dynamic. And, and here you're focusing on the case where F is that and that, the click of that. Or, right. Well, F is conjugation. So this is a little bit reminiscent of quasi-conformal deformation theory, where you start with a Fuchsian group and you conjugate, this is what Teichmiller did, you, or who, this arose out of his considerations. You conjugate it by a homeomorphism of the, um, of the sphere that's quasi-conformal, and that gives you a new group. And those are really complicated maps that are hard to work out explicitly. Here you just have a quadratic polynomial, which is really kind of, it's pretty trivial. But it was sort of inspired by, by that theory. So now let's go into the case where genus G is greater than one, or negative. And um, I was interested in this for a long time, and I started trying to draw pictures of structure. So these are now RP2 structures. And as mentioned before, these things include hyperbolic structures. We have a klein beltrami model. So here we have the subgroup SO21, which is the group of isometries of the hyperbolic plane. And that's sitting inside SL3R, which is the group of projective automorphisms of RP2. So this includes structures. A lot more. Okay, and so I want to focus on the ones that are convex. And this is actually what um, Kuiper was interested in. So I'll subscript this with convex and look at RP2's convex structures. So like the example I just gave, these correspond to representations. The projective manifold is identifies with a quotient of a convex domain, like this Can disk you here. Mean that we do is a straight line? Right. So projective geometry preserves straight lines, but the parametrization is um, distorted. So, so omega is going to be a convex domain inside RP2. I don't think, I think Erisman didn't, he suggests that maybe all of these structures are like this, where the boundary is nice. But in general, the boundary get, can be very fractal. And the first example is due to Vinberg and Katz, 1968, where the boundary of omega is, is um, not smooth. I was interested in this for a long time, and I was drawing computer generated pictures of. Um, of this on a Commodore 64 of all things. And um, the boundary gets rather complicated. It's convex, but it's not C1. So I was very surprised with one day in my mailbox at University of Maryland that these pictures <laughs> made it into the mainstream media. So I can pass this around. You know, this is actually the Wittenberg Katz example, which is actually it's a um, this is a, a thin subgroup of SL3Z. And it arrives, it's, 
It arises in nature as the vial group of cats moving, you know, the hyperbolic cats moving the algebra. I'm very confused about gamma zero x fifty four and gamma zero be only one straight segment between them. That's right. Well, if it's well, you need to be careful about going out to infinity inside RP two. But we fix. We work in one affine patch, and then convexity. So I don't want to think of RP two as a convex subset of itself. The title of that picture is the exotic coxeter group, which would, I certainly right. I would associate with Wilbur. Right. But I don't see why this is how this exotic coxeter group is connected to what you are saying now. But this, I mean, it's acting properly on this on a, on a convex. Is there any any chance you can uh, display the picture? Or maybe give give a copy to Sam. He might display it for us. Yeah. I don't think, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's obvious, but how do you see this omega or gamma, where omega is uh, embedded into RP2 instead of covering some? Well, omega arises as, there's a, there's a domain, this is a Coxeter group, and omega, omega arises very naturally as the union of the oh. fundamental Oh, polyhedra. Mm -hmm. yes. So this is a, but it's and so and this is a yeah it's it's very explicit. I can I don't I can write down that. And this I think that this was so like a, kind of an accidental that this is a cox of the group. There is not yeah. it could be something else. I mean right. it's not it's, yeah not this this is, this theorem is very jack general. Okay, so there, there there are a lot of interesting examples. This is um the. The good news is that this space is again like in the in, in the case I described by 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 Ve, Andre Ve, that the holonomy map maps this into a connected component. Of the deformation space of the character plane. And we're in the good part of the character plane. And now we're in the SL3R character variety. The action and mapping class group. Um, this space also has a description in terms of Fenchel, generalized Fenchel Nielsen coordinates. It's homeomorphic to a sphere of dimension 16 G minus 16. And so there's a six G minus six dimensional type Miller space inside the Fricka space sitting inside there. So this is sometimes called a higher type Miller space. Going through. Um, this is a full connected component. Right, right. How many connected components are there? Uh, I think there's three. This is a theorem independent, of, independent of G for, for yes, this which is actually quite striking because for PSL two R the the there are four G minus three components, so uh -huh. it's linear. It varies with G, but in this case there are only three. And that's the result of If you replace say three by by n, like what like? Well, there are usually many connected components or few connected components. <laughs> n well, it's yeah, and that's a good. General question. So, in this case, the connected components. There's a characteristic class that um, comes in, and that distinguishes one component. And then this is a special component. And this is also it's um, components. This is part of the general theory developed by Nigel Hitchin. Of um, Higgs bundles, and that's using Higgs bundles. That, that's how this result is proved. Infinite dim dimensional Morse theory, space of connections. And um, um, I, the reason I'm asking, I, I'm kind of curious about this question, even in more generality. How many connected components this uh, representation character variety can have? Because by general principle, you know, you can have uh, some. Uh, you can bound it only super exponentially, but 
frankly, I hardly know example that it goes linearly with the... For, for PSL2R it does. PSL, linearly with G. Yeah, it's for no, G no, minus. I, I want the other way around. You fix the group. Right. And you look at homomorphism, say, to SLN R or SLN C. That's can, that'll be... Then it goes... Fine, down. Just, it's, 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 it's independent of the genus. It will be, be a very small number. Right. It depends a lot on the fundamental group of the Lie group. So for SLNR, it'll be um, that has finite fundamental group. Hopefully, I'll second get a chance to say something. Um, I have a question. Um, exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I haven't heard of this uh, uh, Kuiper example. It's, I find it very intriguing. Is this something that happens only in R2, or you, you have a something similar happening in um, R3, say? Or is it a strictly, strictly These examples, no, this is, this generalizes to lots of, into all dimensions. And I think, that, I think it's quite interesting to, really, to the classification of these, these structures. I have also a question about this curve. Of, um, if does the F have some extremal property like the, the Muller map and the Muller theorem? Um, I don't think that's really been extended here. What's been more successful in the theory is, is using harmonic maps. And this is the theory of, really is the theory of Higgs bundles. That's, that's been very successful. I don't want to go in that, so much in that direction, just to mention that we have a nice, I, may, I should mention too that this is, the results I'm describing are um, joint work with them. Um, Yuan Choi. Yeah. Beginning with his PhD thesis, he was a student of Thurston in the nineteen eighties. Um, combining this theorem, I approved earlier, and combining my result with Choi's thesis, um, we found that the full deformation space, you don't necessarily assume convexity then that identifies with the convex deformation space. So that's a 16 G minus 16 dimensional cell crossed with an integer invariant. So that's infinitely many copies of this cell. Excuse me? What is this additional map? Um, it's, it's basically the developing map. Yes. So there's a construction whereby you take a convex structure on a surface and then a structure like a, I'll draw it this way, on a torus. And then you glue in, glue, surgery them together. And that makes a developing map, which is um, very um, complicated. It's not a covering map. No, I'm, 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 I understand. I mean, how, how can it be in one to one correspondence with this quotient, with this product? This as well, this is this has infinitely many connected. That's right. That's right. And, but this is an algebraic variety. Cannot it? No, no. It's it, it maps to an algebraic variety. It's not the character variety. You, can, you have this, this whole full in fact, variety. In fact, this example here that I'm describing. Yeah. Represent the two holonomy representations are equal, so that's where the holonomy map is not injective, mm -hmm. and then you can classify the different topo the topo there's a topological classification of the developing maps once you fix the representation. But some so so I still understand because so this R P square is a subset of some algebraic variety, right? Eventually, no, no, it's just as a this you cannot even conjure up space <laughs> that maps to the. It's a space of developing ah, sections, ah, ah, of sections of the bundle, but it's not one to one. Right, right. 
so uh, another example, maybe a simpler example. And the map is always this or That's right. Let me, let me give a simpler example, which illustrates this idea. I'll put it on this invisible most of the time. So this is a this is a good example to think about too. You take this is an affine structure. So take the plane and take your favorite expansion, like multiplication by two, and then a fundamental a fundamental domain is the re, is this annulus that's bounded by two concentric circles. So sigma here is a two torus. Identify the inner boundary with the outer boundary. Okay. And the holonomy representation is easy to see. There's one loop that goes around here that has trivial holonomy, and then one loop that lifts to a, an interval that goes from the inner boundary to the outer boundary. So that has holonomy multiplication by two. Okay, now, now we can modify this example by taking a double cover. So the fundamental domain now will wrap around twice and we'll try to draw one. This. And that's also a torus. So the torus double covers itself, but it's a different structure. And there, you can write down invariants that distinguish them. So in the picture, you have the deformation space of structures on the Surface goes into the character variety. Polynomy map. This shows that you can have two different structures that have the same holonomy. And that's this example that I described before is that where you have an extra perm that's not convex is an example. Much more complicated example than, than this. This actually just exists on the circle. The circle has an RP1 structure because it's homeomorphic to RP1, and you can take the double cover of it. Double cover of RP1 has an RP1 structure. Okay, so. When you were having R of 16 minus 1 right. times M, is N really integral or just any? It's just, no, I, I just call it, it's just a, a countable set. Yeah, the, um, let's see, there's, I mean, there, there's an explicit description of it. But, okay. Okay, so for, so, and let me just close by saying what's good news if you're a function theorist, and that's that the action is. Properly. I find quite striking because it's a real mess for affine structures on the torus when the genus is one. Whereas this is a lot more complicated topology for sigma, but the, um, the deformation theory is, is much easier. Now, that's, that's usually what happened with what is now they call the itching, the, the, the itching component. Right. right. So, so this all generalizes. The, Hitching components, and then there are even more ones where keyword is now called higher type one up there. But I want to go in a different direction. Those cases are where the action is nice and proper. And when in just in the case of PSL2R, if you work in other components than the Fricka space, then the action looks quite likely to be chaotic. Any questions before I move to the next part of the talk? I'm not going to. Uh, there is a logistical issue because uh, we do have a, another talk at 11 with people okay. coming from outside zooming in. So uh, I think you're now going to start talking about the ergodic and the dynamics, right? Right. So and maybe I think we should stop here. 
you can't do justice to it in five minutes. Maybe you can just summarize and then we will arrange another talk later. Okay, that sounds good. I'll be, I, I will have agreed to give the members colloquium on January 24th. So I can no, but this is a learning seminar, so we, we can always arrange something okay. for people who are interested. Yeah. Okay. So I never did really talk about the cubic surfaces or various other things, but in the case where G is a compact Lie group and sigma is a hyperbolic surface, so pi is a closed surface group, then hom pi V mod G, the components of this are detected by an invariant, which is in the fundamental group of the derived sigma of G. So this is a finite group. So, and G is a, so G is a compact group. So those are the components. That's right. That's right. And so, so and this is not a very hard theorem to prove. Um, now, the theorem when G is abelian, then the space hom pi G is itself an abelian group, and the mapping class group. Factors through the homology. Symplectic, the usual symplectic action. Okay. And then in that case, so in general, maybe I'll just say again, this is what I was going to say in the next talk in the, in the working seminar. In the, this space, in the case of a surface group, this tries to be symplectic. to be a symplectic manifold. And in the case that G is compact, you get a nice area form, which by result of Johannes Hupschmann is finite. So you're, and this is always going to be preserved by the mapping class group. And so in the abelian case, you get an action here. And this is just a special case of homogeneous dynamics. In general, when G is equal to SU2, I prove that the action is ergodic on, 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 the, on the space. And then more generally, this is proved that the action is ergodic on each component, on each connected component. I'm a pick roll. And you, you gain the CI. And the idea in all of these cases is to use the fact that the mapping class group is generated by Dane twist. And then this has a symplectic structure. The Dane twists are associated to simple closed curves. You also have nice functions, which are the traces or the lengths of simple closed curves. Those are Hamiltonian. You take, take those functions, those are on the symplectic manifold, the corresponding Hamiltonian flows essentially contain the Dane twists. And then the idea is that it looks like an irrational rotation of a circle, which is the flow of the Hamiltonian flow. And then you bootstrap your way up to using the Dane twists on the surface to prove ergodicity. So this is in the case of compact groups. It's especially interesting in the case of non-compact Lie groups. And that's where you look at what gets into looking at interesting classes of cubic surfaces like the Markov surface, the Klebsch surface. And that'll be it. So what's the typical situation? So in the non-compact group, you have this each the component on which it acts properly. What right. happens in the other component? It's known? Um, for SL3R? I don't think it's known. It's, uh, it's presumably, it's actually quite chaotic. I'm sure it's, it's quite chaotic. 
or got it. Uh-huh. Now, in SL two R, it's known that the action on all uh, on all the other component except the Teichmuller is ergodic. Only in genus two. Only in genus two. Only in genus two. This is not. Yeah, by Marsh Marsh and Wolf. Uh-huh. So it's but, not. Um, it's, it's not that it, it seems quite. It, it, what? It seems quite likely that it's true in general, and that's the only place that's so far. So even in this case, it's not so well. It's quite interesting. And then, you, then there's the question of trying to realize these things as geometric structures and analyze the holonomy map, because now the geometric structures can be thought of as sort of a resolution of the dynamics where you might have more structure and that's sort of being collapsed down, like putting on hyperbolic structure with, with conical singularities will give you a nice space for the proper action, and then that collapses down. But I should stop here. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,